Hey everyone, what's good? It's your boy BQ on a cold, rainy Illinois. I don't know if it's cold, but it's definitely a rainy Illinois morning. And I'm your boy BQ with the B-Side Podcast, brought to you by the Impact Lounge, which is the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. Haven't given you guys a whole lot of content in the month of June, and I hope I did a decent job in preparing you for letting you know that uh, life was not going to allow me to create a whole lot of content for a while. So I, I definitely apologize for that, for, for not bringing the podcast. Uh, TW has held the Cool Factor podcast down pretty well, and I, you know, unfortunately I haven't had opportunity to appear on it, uh, but give, give me about two weeks and I should be back in the saddle regarding that, and hopefully, hopefully being a little more consistent with the content, you know, and uh, again, this just boiled down to a work thing, uh, to where I was, I was working a good six, seven days a week for a really, really long time. And things have things have calmed down. My my work schedule has actually changed, uh, which has given me a little bit more, uh, a little more flexibility. But uh, you know, there's still a little overtime that I got to worry about. And then uh, taking the family to Hawaii next week already. So uh, been looking forward to that for a while. So when I get back from my uh, vacation in the middle of July, um, or end of the yeah middle of July, something like that, 10th, 11th, then uh, we're gonna get back on the ball. So. I haven't had an opportunity to, you know, talk with any of you guys or read your thoughts, really. I mean, I just kind of hopped back on Twitter the other day for the first time in a while. Every once in a while, you know, I'll throw some random tweets out there, but um, just haven't really had the time to really sit down and, and tweet and check out social media, get a whole lot of uh, thoughts from you guys, what's going on with Impact right now, and I haven't really been able to give a lot of my thoughts, you know. So there are a couple things I want to talk about here. And uh, we're going to talk about Against All Odds here. And, you know, granted, this show happened, what, a couple weeks ago. So uh, I'm not going to review this show because it'd be kind of pointless at this point. But if we want to talk about, uh, you know, my general thoughts of the show, you know, the Impact Plus shows continue to deliver. You know, they continue to be, uh, they're, they've been more, in, probably more enjoyable for me than, than the average impact show, even though they kind of feel like an impact program more than they do a pay-per-view. But they've been they've been uh they've been pretty good. There was a period of time for a good like two years where these shows were horrible. And they've really stepped them up. Um, I think we have fans have challenged them to do that. And they've uh you know they stepped to the plate for the most part with these shows. Uh, I think the only problem with the Against All Odds show was that it was it was it was pretty predictable. You know, we're in slam anniversary season. We know the big pay per views coming up. The roster's still pretty small. There's there's still a lot we want to see as far as personnel and everyone added. And so we can just get fresh matches, you know? Every just nothing feels fresh right now, which is which is pretty disappointing. But I think that they wait for this you know, you can blame it on the pandemic a little bit, but I also think that they wait for this time of year every summer, or that's going to be the new trend at least, uh, to see who the WWE releases so that they can get, you know, they can get in on that. And, who, you know, and I think once Slammiversary has come and gone, I'm expecting, and I think you all are as well, just a much fresher product as far as the matches and, and what we see on TV and the feuds and not, really just not seeing the same thing over and over. But against all odds, pretty predictable. For the most part, but it was a good show. It only really got two thumbs downs for me. Uh, one was the X Division match and the finish. And it, it, the match was a lot of fun. I'm not, I, I was talking about, I'm not a big fan of let's put four, five, six guys in a match and have a car crash. That's just not the way I enjoy to watch because then it starts becoming really, really scripted. It becomes, you know, really choreographed. That's just not the way I, as a fan, in my, you know, almost 42 years of, of living, have just grown to enjoy wrestling. I like to be invested in a feud of, of a one-on-one -on -one match. And as I'm watching this match, though, it's funny because, you know, again, this was a five-way match for the number one contendership for the X Division Championship. Uh, I believe at Slammiversary. I think that's where they're... I think there was, that's where they're supposed to take him to uh, take on Josh Alexander. And as I'm watching this match, I'm am saying to myself, "Wow, finally we're just going to get a you know a definitive winner, and we're going to get a 
a one-on-one -on -one match at Slammiversary for the Exhibition Championship. None of this multi-man, you know, stuff. What did we get the last pay-per-view? It was like a triple threat. And I was, I was kind of critical of that. I said I would have rather just seen TJP versus Josh Alexander. I thought that Ace Austin having the title at the time was kind of pointless. And he, he really seemed like the third wheel in that whole feud. And he was the champ. Because I would say, it waters for me, it waters down the story every time you add another person into the match. So the match itself was a lot of fun. I thought Trey Miguel was going to win. I was positive this dude was going to win. And, you know, the, the previous episode of Impact I hadn't actually seen uh, before watching Against All Odds. So you guys already know there was the angle with Matt. They all attacked Madman Fulton and everything. And then Madman Fulton shows up at the match and ruins it. Tries to get Ace Austin to win. It's a no disqualification match, but they still called a no contest, which... I don't really care about that part because a referee, if we're, if we're trying to be realistic here, if they want to call a no contest on something, that's their prerogative, right? And I, I don't want to say this was totally uh, in, uncreative because it wasn't, you know. They did have a little roundabout story that it lasted two, three weeks, whatever, that got them there to that point. But let's take a company like Ring of Honor, okay? If Ring of Honor was going to have an Ultimate X match, which this is ultimately what happened. Everyone lost the match. They threw it out, and now they're, now they're like, okay, well, there's going to be a six-way Ultimate X match at Slammiversary. Take a company like Ring of Honor, okay? Obviously, they don't do the Ultimate X. That's an Impact Wrestling thing. But if they were saying, okay, we've got our anniversary show coming up, and we're going to have this big match. We'll just say for sake of argument, it's the Ultimate X match. You know, they would present it like a, more of a sport. And they would leverage social media a little bit and say, okay, you know, we're going to announce uh, one contender per day, one challenger per day for the X Division Championship, you know, on Monday at 12 Eastern on Twitter, we're going to announce entrant number one. All right. And that's what, that's where you leverage social media to where Impact is always, always kind of clueless on this. Let, let's, let's be honest. But you see other companies do it. If you, if you watch any other company, even as small as MLW, all the way up to WWE. You see everyone else doing this kind of stuff. You know, but we're going to enter number one on Twitter. Twitter. If it were me, I would be like, okay, enter number two. I'm going to announce that person on Facebook on Twitter. and I mean, uh, not on Twitter, I'm sorry, on Facebook. So I'd go Monday, Twitter, noon, East, noon Eastern. Tuesday, Facebook, noon Eastern. And then I'd probably Wednesday do uh, YouTube. You know what I mean? You know me. I like to bounce one uh, people from one platform to another. That's the way I think you should do it. But to get us there with this finish of, okay, we're going to sit through this whole five-way match, and then Madman Fulton is going to come and ruin the match, and now we just have to make it a six-way match at the, at the pay-per-view. Like Sometimes you, you, you try to rely on a story too much instead of just how what's the most effective way we can get people excited for this match. So... I just thought it was a waste of my time as a viewer to sit through, you know, 15 minutes of people wrestling just for there to be no finish. And then just to, you know, it's just not my thing. It might be your thing. Uh, that That's just not the way I enjoy getting into a feud. There's no, like, blood feud in it for me like that. So if there's going to be no blood feud, at least, you know, find a way to present it more as a sport and, and you know, leverage social media to the best of your advantage. The other thumbs down was the finish, and, and, and it's a common theme here, okay? The finishes, not the matches itself. The matches themselves are usually good. I don't usually have an issue with the actual wrestling that Impact does. You know, I think they've been for several years now pretty good. But the finish to Moose and Sammy Cal or excuse me, Moose and Kenny Omega. So Moose was challenging for the Impact World Championship. This was what we were really looking forward to. It happened in Daly's place. And it was, man, it was, for me, really, really fresh. And, and I watch AEW, but it was fresh to see Moose inside the AEW ring. And then we got different commentary. And you guys have been hearing me say a little bit where, even though I, I kind of like what Matt Stryker and D'Lo do, I think it's a step up from Josh Matthews, it still comes across very rehearsed and fake a lot of the time. The way that, oh my goodness, oh, you know, the whole world is talking about, like, shit. Okay, you know what I mean? But when we were listening to Don Callis, who you guys know I, didn't previously care for on color, at least not with impact. 
Him, Scott Dumore. Scott Dumore is the best in the booth, in my opinion, in the whole company when it comes to commentary. Him and Tony Schiavone. And if you were listening to this match, it was very free-flowing. It was very loose. It was very real, like the way that the commentary is being presented. That's. I just would like to see more of that from Impact because I feel like it just comes across really, really rehearsed. And uh, it comes across like, it, like if you watch on High Spots or something like that, like, oh, I'm going to check out an independent show uh, I pay per view this week, and, and you listen to that commentary team, like that's how impacts is coming across. So I just want to see improvement. Um, Josh Josh Matthews called this show though, and just when I was getting ready to give him his props again because I thought he was sounding good on the actual episodes of Impact, like when it came to the Impact Plus show to, against all odds, like I thought he was right back to just annoying me, you know, like immediately I just wanted to kind of like shut him off, but it's so whatever. But the finish. You know, again, this is just out of like wrestling 101. You know, good match, and then at the end, the young bucks come and ruin the match. You already ruined a number one contenders match earlier in the night with with uh, outside interference. Now you're doing it again. You know, uh, Chris Jericho was saying the other day on a podcast. I think it might have been on his own show. I'm sure it was. That's really the only podcast he does. But he was saying. You know, when you're in the main event, you have the priority of this is how the match is going to go. These are the moves we're going to use. This is the way the finish is going to go. And once the main event is is laid out, then the rest of the matches in the card fill in the holes. Like, if there's going to be somebody winning with a super kick at the end of the main event, no one's going to win with a super kick earlier in the night. If, if that makes sense, what I'm, what I'm saying to you guys. So, when you already get one of those finishes earlier in the night where it's just chaos and there's not really a finish and then you get the main event where it, essentially you get the same thing but the mat you know they did have a finish to the match because Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks cheat to win and he holds on to the title and I think we resort to this too many times on the impact programming like I don't see it on AEW a whole lot of finishes like that they're not afraid to say, okay, this guy lost. This guy had a bad match and he lost. He had a bad night and lost. This guy had a good night and he lost. It's all how you build that guy up the next episode. You know, if, if that loss is going to hurt him that much. But they're afraid to have Moose lose. They're afraid to have Kenny Omega lose. So what do they do? The Ken, you know, the Young Bucks come down, ruin the match. Uh, Kenny Omega gets a, a cheat win. All right. So again, I'm not going to review against all odds. I know I talked about it a little bit, but I wanted to give thoughts on those two matches. Uh, really just disappointed with how they ended. But here's here's like the common sense, the logic part of it that really bothers me. Moose wins at the last Impact Plus show, whatever it was, under Siege, I believe. He wins this six-way match. You, again, you guys know I love these multi-man matches. He wins a six-way match. He has the right to challenge Kenny Omega to get the Impact World Championship back. And they give him an Impact Plus show match. Now, if, if Moose were to win this match, that means he would have had to go on a Slammiversary and challenge and, and uh, defend the title again. So you're talking the guy who won the six-way, in a sense, is being rewarded by having to wrestle twice in the two biggest matches of the year in a 30-day span, basically. To where Sammy Callahan, you know, he gets to challenge the winner. Like, he didn't even win the six-way. But somehow, he gets rewarded with the main event at Slammiversary. And this is why I don't like to muddy up the title picture. Because when it was Moose versus Kenny Omega and they were trying to build that up, they kept bringing Sammy Callahan into the fold. You know, he kept getting involved in the storyline. And that lets you know that Moose wasn't going to win it against all odds. That's just letting us know who's going to win ahead of time in a match. And that like drives me crazy. The way I had said that this whole Kenny Omega storyline was going to work is if they gave him one challenger at a time and didn't forecast the story ahead of time. Like when when Omega eventually loses the title, we want to we want it to be out of nowhere, like something we did not even expect. You know what I mean? If you focus on one feud, one opponent at a time, you can get there. But now it's like, when he does eventually drop it, which I don't think is going to be a slam anniversary, because I think they want him to wrestle Eddie Edwards, 
probably a Bound for Glory. Could be on Impact Plus, who knows. But I think Eddie Edwards is the one who's going to take the title off him. And But we're going to know it ahead of time. That's all, that's all I'm saying. I think when Kenny dropped the title, we're going to know it ahead of time very clearly. That's why I don't think it's happening at, happening at Slam Reversary. Um, so, you know, all that being said, I just, I don't, I don't really like, I, I feel like Moose deserved to be in this main event. He earned the spot to be in the main event. And then they take a technicality to where when Moose and Sammy had that match a couple weeks ago and it was interrupted by the Good Brothers and Kenny Omega, you know, we know that should have been a non-finish, okay? We talked about the man, man, man Fulton causing a non-finish. Instead of a non-finish, Scott Demore is like, oh, well, Sammy Callahan won by disqualification, which he just so happened to win by that same exact rule a few weeks ago against Eddie Edwards. Uh, to, to be in that Under Siege main event. So you're using the same story twice in regards to Sammy Callahan. So how is that building any kind of momentum? He hasn't beat anybody, I don't think, since, you know, in the last couple months. He hasn't had any, like, one-on-one -on -one match, one -on -one matches where he's actually beat anybody. So Sammy Callahan doesn't have any momentum right now. And he loses almost every single pay-per-view match. You know, so how... That's one thing. Like, how we ex how is how are we supposed to expect that he's going to win this match? We're trying to get lost in the moment, right? And just be a wrestling fan and just enjoy the show. But we want to get lost in the moment too, and we want to be surprised sometimes. And I don't feel like they're doing a good job of setting setting Sammy up. And I don't think it was fair to Moose. Moose should have had this main event slot at Slammiversary because he earned it. And Sammy Callahan did not earn the position he's being given right now, the match that he's being given. The biggest pay-per-view of the year wins a couple DQ matches by technicality. And, and now he's in a main event. Speaking of which, though, this whole angle where Don Callis fired Sammy Callahan, I mean, I was interested in I'm like, okay, they're trying to give us a, a, a cliffhanger for the following episode, which wrestling doesn't do that. I'm a big fan of, you know, Arrow and shows like that. I know Arrow's not on a, on TV anymore, but episode to episode when you're watching Arrow, like there's some kind of cliffhanger and wrestling doesn't know how to, how to do that. They've never been able to do that. So like, I mean, sometimes they do, but for the most part, wrestling in general has not been able to capture how do we how do we end a show with a cliffhanger to make people want to tune in the, the following week? You know? It's always the, the traditional, oh, there's a sneak attack and things like that. And that's why people criticize WWE for hiring, hiring writers who aren't wrestling fans. Well, I'm like, that's probably why. You know, you, you can't always be in that wrestling bubble. You know, when you create episodic television. Um, yeah, so that being said... You know, they did give us a little bit of a cliffhanger. They're like, okay, Sammy Callahan's been fired... Any of us smart fans know he wasn't really fired. Some people thought he was. And then they did this angle. This is where they... This, this was so bad, folks. Uh, and the episode... I watched the episode live, actually. You know, you guys know I don't usually watch it as it airs. This episode I did get a chance to watch. No, you know what? That was the previous week, so never mind. I did watch this one the next day. But the show, the show up to that point was pretty good. And then they're teasing the whole episode... That, uh, that someone from Anthem, uh, from the board, is going to come down and address uh, Don Callis and Scott Demore, which I don't know who I was talking to on Facebook, you know, because I, I have little conversations here and there, but I said, I would imagine someone from the board, quote unquote, is going to come down and fire Don Callis to get him off television. That's what I was fairly certain was going to happen. And that's what happened. But this was a rare opportunity to do something big and different and exciting and have um god what's his name the owner it, it's totally escaping me right now i'm sorry ed norholm this was a rare opportunity to just have him come on television or you could even have said okay gail kim is on the board of anthem you could have you could have, anybody dr ross you could have done anybody but who did they have come out? Tommy Dreamer. 
Okay, someone who you know is just employed by Impact Wrestling and is not on the Anthem Board of Directors. He was just an employee. Scott just told him two weeks ago, well, Don's your boss. Like, how is he an employee and all of a sudden he's on the Board of Directors uh, two weeks later? Like, that is where, those are those small details that... You're just like, man, I'm just watching fake wrestling. And I know that's a word that we don't like as wrestling fans, right? The F word. But that's what that's where we're like, we're just watching fake wrestling at this point. I mean, Tommy Dreamer. They, it, It's like telling your kids, um, you know, they want McDonald's. You're like, well, we got food at home. And then you just end up warming up something from dinner the night before. You know, like, that's definitely not McDonald's. It's... Just because Tommy Dreamer's on hand, on st- like you don't have to use, just hire an actor. If it, 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 don't don't just grab someone because he's there. This whole jack of all trades thing that they try to do, where they where they have one guy play all these multiple backstage roles, like it's not funny, it's not cute. They could have had anybody, and made this more interesting. Like, can you imagine that the, the we're going back to like, social media and. and, and headlines on the dirt sheets and the wrestling sites like can you imagine if ed would have shown up if if, again if you want to even just say gail kim is part of the board can you imagine what social media would have been the next day if the actual owner of the company came down and fired him but instead we had someone who we know is an employee masquerade as someone on the board of directors and fire him so that angle to me was so bad like that was just like the biggest thumbs down of anything they've done in a while um so it's weird because we have these like really really good things that they do and these good moments and these good matches and these you know sometimes we have these good angles and then they just it's like the exact opposite on some of this stuff ringside news reported that they know who's going to beat kenny omega not they they don't know but impact knows who's going to beat kenny omega they've always known who's going to beat him um I have a hard time believing that he's going to defend the title one time and lose it. So he he beats Rich Swan for the title, beats Moose in a defense. I don't I don't believe he's going to go wrestle Sammy Sammy Callahan and lose at this point. Sammy, as I said earlier, has no momentum whatsoever. So I just think he's going to beat Sammy Callahan. I think they want him to wrestle Eddie Edwards. That's it. Like, I would have liked to have seen. And again, you don't want to overuse Kenny Omega, but. You know, every other week or every third week, he defends the title. And sometimes, well, one day it's against TJP. One day it's against, uh, who's another name? Did you guys remember, if you watched WWE, and John Cena did the uh, Open Challenge a while ago. To where he was, he was a lot bigger than the U.S. title. A lot bigger than doing an Open Challenge. But he had very random opponents, and it got... An opportunity for them to get some real shine. So what if, you know, Kenny is doing open challenges. One week it's TJP. One week it's freaking Falaba. Then it's Rohit. You know, you're throwing baby faces and, and heels at them. There's just, there was just such a more interesting way they could have done it. And maybe they felt like, okay, the roster's too small. We can't have all of them lose the Kenny Omega. Like, I can get that. But uh, Sammy Callahan is not going to beat him. I don't, I don't think that's what they're going to do. Um, but but Impact knows where they're going with it, which is good. That's a good thing. They're not playing it by ear. And I think it's going to be Eddie Edwards ultimately. I really, 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 really do. Um, and the last thing I want to say, ringsidenews.com was also reporting that, you know, there's going to be new phases of Slammiversary. We already know that. It doesn't have near the buzz that it did last year. I mean, it's not even, not even close. And why is that? Because the free agent pool is not as enticing. You know, people are, a lot of people are saying, well, who could they, who could they even bring on to make it that, that, that big of a deal? You know, it's not going to be Samoa Joe. I don't think people are expecting Daniel Bryan to show. There's probably a better chance that I show up and wrestle than Daniel Bryan showing up. Maybe he does. I could be wrong. Hopefully I'm wrong. That would be pretty cool. I don't think he's, I don't think there's a chance in hell he shows up though. And if he does, it's going to be for like a match or two. But a lot of people are saying, well, what? There's no, there's no one exciting who could show up, potentially. You know, where last year the free agent crop was a little bit better. 
But ringsidenews.com uh, is also saying, you know, they're going to try to revamp the knockouts a little bit, which we've talked about this many, many times. There was a point where the knockouts division was looking really, really strong, and then it went downhill fast. Once they lost Kylie Ray, once they lost Taya Valkyrie, it's just like, what am I watching at this point? And they're going to church it up and, and polish it up. And like, this is the best women's division in wrestling. It's not. It's not. Okay? Sorry to burst bubbles. I know I'm an impact guy. I don't mean to upset anyone. It's not. Okay? But they have the opportunity to get there. You just have to sign the right people. It's always going to be difficult for, for them to sign main event talent in the males division, in the men's division, with AEW existing, and there's other companies. But they are always going to be in a play for the women. Always, always, always. So you've got to do your best to bring in hot talent from the indies and freshen up the division as much as possible. Because then when they do bring new names in, we get Taylor Wilde, which, she, you know, she's been cool for the most part. You know, her theme song is horrible. But other than that, she, she's been cool, but it's like enough with the nostalgia. Like, just bring us some girls that we can latch on to that we feel like is going to be around for a while. So, you know, Rachel Ellering falls in that ballpark, but she's not she's not being presented like a star. She's being presented like a good wrestler, but she's not... She has a lot of work to do. She has some ring rust. She has to shake off. She has to get in better shape. Um, and she might be able to get to the Knockouts Championship title picture be taken seriously as a, as a good baby face champion but they they definitely got to add some 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 ladies in there because right now diana's is is has no challengers fire and flavor has have no challengers and you've got enough women on the roster to have challengers it's just the they're not presenting them in a way that you know any of these women are important unless they have a title that's that's really like where the problem lies and then you have Almost everyone's a heel. You got all these heel versus heel matches going on, you know. And if if you think if the iconic show up at Slammiversary, they're just going to be heels to team up with um, uh, Tenille Dashwood, right? You know, they they just don't have the clear cut baby faces, clear cut stars in that division, and they got to figure it out. They have to, have to, have to, because that division is is getting very, very boring, very fast, and. We need new life. I mean, they have brought some new girls in over the last couple of months, but we need some new life that's sustainable and is we're not getting the same matches over and 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 over because that's what it is with the knockouts. That's what I got for you guys this morning. I'm your boy BQ. Had a little time this morning to chat with you, to wrap with you, and hopefully uh, middle of July, get back on the ball doing the Cool Factor podcast and just content in general for the channel. So thanks for checking me out. I'm your boy. I'm out. Peace.